Acute respiratory failure is not a primary diagnosis. This is always secondary to something else. There are so many causes that lead to it. I'll show you a chart. Or maybe not. There's no chart. Okay. So there are two types of respiratory failure. It can be hypoxemic, meaning you have low oxygen, or it could be hypercapnic or high CO2. All right. So how does this happen? Various causes again. So let me name a few of the causes. So it's a combination of there are some pulmonary causes and then there are extra pulmonary causes as well. So examples are drug overdose, head trauma, infection, hemorrhage, sleep apnea. Um, Myasthenia gravis. So as you can see, are they all respiratory? Well, they're sleep apnea. That's it, right? The others, uh, you can also add sepsis here. Uh, pneumonia could be a cause, COPD. That, But that's about the pulmonary causes. Others are non-pulmonary or extra-pulmonary, you know, outside the respiratory system. So what would cause hypoxemic or hypercapnic? Based on the definition or the criteria for you to be in respiratory failure is uh, there are three things you, you must meet. Your arterial blood gas must show a PaO2 of less than 60. Number two, a PaCO2 of greater than 50. And three, pH of less than 7.35, which is acidosis. And in all of these cases, what will happen to the oxygen saturation, Ms. Kyoto? Less than 90%. Okay, less than 90% oxygen saturation. All right, so therefore, what do, if you look at the causes, various causes, what do they all have in common? Let's say you overdose on, I don't know, morphine or, I don't know, oxycodone, or you had head trauma, infection. When we say infection, we say sepsis, okay? When he says infection, we're really referring to sepsis. Hemorrhage, sleep apnea. Myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, ALS, spinal cord trauma. What do they have in common relating to respiratory? You're getting warmer. Go on, Miss Simon. What happens to their breathing? Okay, so any condition, therefore, that leads to a slow and shallow Breathing, meaning the rate and the depth of, re of the respiration goes down, meaning the respiratory rate is less than 10. The depth of the respiration is shallow. Can that lead to a PaO2 of less than 60? Can that lead to a PaCO2 of more than 50? Can that lead to acidosis? Yes. So these are the conditions that lead to respiratory failure. You understand? So therefore, will a patient come in with a primary diagnosis of respiratory failure? No. What will their, di their diagnosis be? It could be sepsis with respiratory failure or drug overdose with respiratory failure, pneumonia with respiratory failure, and then the, the list goes on. Are we clear? Okay, so they don't come in with only that diagnosis of respiratory failure meaning they had something else and then they went into respiratory failure because of that. Can we add obesity there as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, because let's say you weigh 600 pounds or bigger. What happens to abdominal pressure? Can the diaphragm ex expand okay, against that in intra-abdominal pressure? No, so there would be shallow breathing result, right? Okay, so let's say that uh, obese patient... Um, has you know uh, has is married and then you know they 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 um they make love and then sh that partner is on top of the partner that is non obese well can that partner also 
experience respiratory failure? Yes, because of the weight, right? Okay, so it can be a lot. There's really no end to the list. So it doesn't, it's not really restricted to these. Again, what are what do all of these conditions have in common? The rate and the depth of the respiration drops. And so oxygen, blood oxygen levels in the arterial blood drops, and then CO2 levels rise, and as a result, pH will drop below 7.35. And of course, when your PaO2 is less than 60, can your oxygenation, oxygenation, uh, oxygen saturation possibly over nine, be over 90? No. <clears throat> so manifestations, what happens if your oxygen levels are low? Is there specific manifestations here exclusively found in respiratory failure? No, it'll be just like any other patient in respiratory distress. So uh, the pneumonia patient, for example, will have exactly those ABG results and their saturation will be below 90%. Okay, so when, when, when that's the result of the ABG, when we draw it, we, we say that they are now in respiratory failure. Now, what's the treatment? <clears throat> what led to it in the first place? Various conditions, right? So therefore, will the respiratory failure resolve without treating the underlying condition? No. However, can we afford to treat the underlying condition first before we treat respiratory failure? We can. We can wait. You know, let's wait. Let's treat the pneumonia first and then that will resolve. Can we do that? No, this patient will die before, right, before the pneumonia is resolved. So therefore, do we need to treat this first? Yeah. Okay, the only treatment here is oxygen. That's it. However, however much oxygen we need, let's say if they respond with oxygen by cannula, okay, keep them on cannula. If not, then you pro progress to, what do you do next? It didn't work with nasal cannula. You can only deliver how much by a nasal cannula? Six liters. So after that, no response. Oxygen saturation stays below 90. PaO2 remains less than 60. PaCO2 remains over 50. So what do we do? What's next? Cannula didn't work. So mask. Okay, so you go to simple mask, didn't work. Then where do you go next? Non-rebreather. After that, no more. Still nothing. What do you do? We well not yet. Okay, we'll do we'll try CPAP BiPAP first. Yeah, non-invasive first. Still no improvement on okay, then we intubate. Okay, we'll discuss intubation a little bit later. <clears throat> so that's all. We just give oxygen. You're on page 556, yeah? Yeah. Okay, stay there. Okay, stay with me on the on your textbook. So that's it. So you support the patient with oxygen until the underlying condition improves or resolves, and then hopefully the respiratory failure will also resolve. All right? But we need to keep them alive, yes? Yeah. Okay, so you need oxygen support until again, what? Okay. Uh, until... What led to respiratory failure again? Okay, the underlying cause is resolved. Okay, so because will the respiratory failure ever go away? Not until the underlying condition resolved. But you support them with oxygen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so here we are now with, let's say the scenario is they did not improve. Okay, so now you call rapid response, and then the doctors decide, okay, let's intubate the patient. Let's say our patient is Mei Jean. <clears throat> so Mei Jean is now confused. She has mental status change. She's not making any sense. She's not responding to our questions because her PaO2 is less than 60, PaO2 over 50. Her blood pH is 7.31, all right? And she has these manifestations here. So first of all is the mental status change. She's restless, okay, pulling everything, pulling her gown. She's now naked, okay, pulling. She, she had a foley. She's pulling the, the foley, okay, so totally confused because of severe 
hypoxemia, okay? So she, no oxygen to the brain. So she'll have all of these here. So she's, uh, she's gasping for air, <clears throat> etc. And then as she got worse, she now got really confused, lethargic. And then finally, <clears throat> she's impending respiratory arrest. She's only breathing six times a minute, okay? So that's how bad she is. So now the team called RRT and then they decide to intubate. <clears throat> so they drew blood gas right away. Two minutes later, we got the result, reflected respiratory failure. Okay, so now uh, here's intubation. So we need um, a plastic airway in order to put the patient on a mechanical ventilator. So we don't do a trach yet because we don't know. A trach is unnecessary uh, because there's no evidence of airway obstruction. Now, a tracheostomy will only be considered if the patient needs mechanical ventilation for longer than two weeks. Okay, so a patient can be on a ventilator with an endotracheal tube for up to two weeks. Now, why? Why can't we indefinitely put the patient on a vent with an endotracheal tube? Long Oh, doesn't make sense. Uh, I mean, doesn't make a difference whether it's an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy. You're still on a vent. So why why can't we use this too long? What Infection. what can't what can't a patient do if you have a plastic airway in your mouth? You cannot eat. What else? What else can't you do? Talk. You can't talk. Can you can you be comfortable with this? No. So therefore, what's a better option? Because if you have an endotracheal tube, can you tolerate being awake with knowing there's a tube here and there's nothing you can do? Okay, so we have to sedate you with an endotracheal tube. So we can't do that forever, right? So now we'll have to switch you. So let's say the patient doesn't improve after two weeks. Doctors will plan ahead and say, oh, we don't think this will improve. So... We'll schedule a trach. Okay, so okay, let's do a trach on Tuesday, for instance. So today's uh what Friday. Okay, and then uh, let's say the 14th day will be Tuesday. Okay, let's switch them to a trach on Tuesday. So they'll schedule now, okay, who's on call, who's working that day. All right, put this on the list. All right. <clears throat> so let's look at first uh endotracheal tube. So we put it through the mouth. In order to insert this, we do rapid sequence intubation now. So during my time, we did not. We simply held the patient down. So there will be up to six of us holding a patient down. Okay? Because the patient will be confused, right? You saw the manifestations here, right? So is this patient going to cooperate? Okay, Mei Jean will be thrashing around. Okay, So no matter how low her oxygen level is, she's confused. So she, what will she, how will she perceive if, let's say, Ms. Kalu is there trying to put in an IV? And um, Hannah, okay, she's going to think that they're trying to hurt her, right? Mm -hmm. So she will be kicking and screaming, okay? No matter how difficult it is for her to even move. So she'll use whatever ounce of energy she has left to punch everybody. Mm -hmm. So during my time, you know, some, some nurses lost their teeth, got kicked in the balls because we didn't have the rapid sequence um, procedure yet. So now... It's now standard that we do RSI. It takes 30 minutes, I mean, 30 seconds to put in an uh, endotracheal tube now. So all we need is to sedate the patient. So we have short-acting muscle paralyzers, like you've heard of uh, rocuronium or vacuronium. Okay, so these are <clears throat> short-term muscle paralyzers. So we, we have to paralyze uh, May Jean, uh, so that she doesn't move. Okay, so it'll be very peaceful. Okay, so we we don't break her teeth either because if she's moving, then we put a steel, a stainless steel laryngoscope, and she bites on it. She could break her teeth, right? So it's very peaceful. Push the rocuronium. She'll be out in three four seconds, and then we uh we put in a laryngoscope, and then peacefully put in the endotracheal tube. Okay, <clears throat> and then that's it. 30 seconds later, we the airway is in, all right? So what are our duties? So your role here 
it's because we're not the one intubating, it'll be the respiratory therapist, and then a doctor, a resident will be there who will push the rocuronium to paralyze Meijing, and then the respiratory therapist or a doctor will insert the tube. So our role here was to initiate, correct? You were the nurse, so you called RRT, and then you make sure the, the room is clear so that the team can come in, move the bed off the wall because the person intubating needs to stand at the head of the bed. Hey, they can't do that if your bed is against the wall, okay? So very important. Your, your job is to prepare the, the room. So they'll be, they'll be there in under two minutes. Okay, so move, move the bed and then crash cart is outside. Uh, we'll talk more about the drugs you'll need um, later when we get to the mechanical ventilation. <clears throat> okay. So first is look at the tube. Is it a perfect fit? No. No, I mean, is it a perfect fit wherein, you know, it will seal the... Airway, hundred percent. No. Okay. No. Um. So the objective is, since this patient is obviously in respiratory failure, right? So that's one of the indications of when we intubate. Okay. Um. We'll we'll do more. Um. We'll we'll name a few more indications later. So let's say this is the scenario under respiratory failure. So our oxygen ex no non invasive oxygen delivery is not working. So now we decided to intubate. So the objective is to use the mechanical ventilator to push the air into both lungs. So in order for that to happen, what is our normal breathing mechanism? How do we breathe? How are you breathing right now? Okay, so the mechanism is negative pressure, correct? We are negative pressure ventilators. So we have the pleura surrounding each lung, yeah? So how we breathe is our diaphragm controlled by the brain, contracts downward, and because there's positive pressure in the atmosphere, air will be sucked in. So as soon as, uh, uh, when your diaphragm contracts downward, air is sucked into your both lungs. And then when the diaphragm pushes back up, air is also passively exhaled, all right? So totally effortless, all done by the diaphragm. Contracts down, you breathe in, contracts up, you breathe out, okay? So that's how we breathe. Is this gonna be the same? No, because now a ventilator will push the air under pressure into both lungs. So will there be some resistance? Yes, you, unless your lung has a hole. Your lungs don't have a hole. So the lungs are intact. So therefore, the vent has to deliver the air under high pressure to force it into the lungs. You follow? Okay. Mm -hmm. So now for that to happen, and let's say this tube is like this. Will all the air go into the lungs? Because remember, the lungs will exert resistance. So therefore, what do we need the tube to do? Because when you think about it, if air is pushed in here and there is no perfect fit here, will there be some air that will leak around here? Yes, because there is resistance, right? The resistance will pose, I mean, the lungs will pose resistance against the ventilator because that's not how we breathe. How do we normally breathe? negative pressure. This one is positive pressure. So now we need to seal this area right here. So there's a cuff on your endotracheal tube and we need to inflate that cuff in order to seal the airway so that all the air only goes through the, the tube. So every breath, inspiration and exhalation must go in and out of that tube. Are we clear? We don't want any air going around around the tube, through the nose, or through the mouth. All air, inspiration, exhalation, must go through that tube only. Because otherwise, how can you maximize the therapy? How do you know your therapy, right? So there should be no leak. Are we clear? You follow so far? All right. Now, how much do we 
inflate this width. So here's the pressure. I'll go up and down the um, paragraphs, okay? So the pressure will be between 20 and 25 millimeters of mercury or between 24 and 30 centimeters of water. Now, how do we measure the pressure? Well, we're going to use a... Uh, manometer. So man the manometer is like a higher page pressure gauge, you know, tire gauge pressure monitor. Um, this one. <clears throat> okay. So this will be on the vent. There'll be a little... bag okay hanging on the vent and this will be in there so the respiratory or whoever intubated the patient so when they inflate the cuff with air so this is the manometer now on the side it's not shown here but on the side will be a um a nozzle which you will connect to the pilot balloon. You see the picture of a tracheostomy, I mean, um, yeah, a tracheostomy tube there? Yeah, right here, it's not showing. But anyway, you see it, right? There's a, there's a balloon on the side. One pic, the first picture says fenestrated and then the other says Okay, right here, sorry. So this is called the pilot balloon, okay? So this is the pilot balloon, and this is where you connect to the manometer. So when you connect that, and then you press the trigger, behind here is a trigger, you know, like a, like a gun trigger. Okay? You press the trigger, it will register the pressure. Can you picture that? Okay. Now, how do we know if the if the cuff is inflated just to the right pressure? Well, we don't until we attach it to the mon manometer. So the person inflating that cuff will use a stethoscope, put it on the neck. We'll have to listen for an air leak. So when we first attach this, I mean, inserted this, so we, we will attach a <clears throat> bag valve mask there first. Okay, so we're going to manually bag the patient first. As we're doing that, since the cuff is still flat, will all the air go here or will it start leaking around? It'll start leaking because the cuff is still flat. Okay, so the person inflating the, the pilot balloon. So here again is the pilot balloon. So you'll attach a syringe here filled with air. So that person will slowly inflate the cuff. And while again, this is not inflated, you will hear what? A leak, right? So you'll hear a, a, an air going through the neck. Like, so the person bagging the patient will, will uh, of course, that's blowing air inside, yeah? So when you, when you listen, since the cuff is flat, so you will hear a leak. So the person will slowly inflate the cuff until the leaking sound disappears. So we call that minimal leak technique. So when the MLT is achieved, meaning you, you inflated the cuff just up to when the, hear, the leak sound disappears, then we stop. After that, you disconnect the syringe and then attach it to the mono manometer. We attach it here now, and then we will get the reading. Now the reading must fall under what again? Okay, so 20 and 25 millimeters of mercury or 24 to 30 centimeters of water. Now, based on evidence, these numbers, these pressures, these pressures are safe so that, because is the trachea living tissue? 
Does it have blood blood vessels? No blood vessels on a living tissue. So your bone and your cartilages don't have blood blood supply. Okay. So since the trachea is living tissue and you compress it with pressure exerted by the cuff, can it cause ischemia? So therefore, if the pressure, as long as the pressure is between these, it will not cause ischemia. Are we clear? All right. Do we all have the same tracheal size, tracheal diameter? Like who it has, likely has a... Uh, larger tracheal di diameter, me or Faith? You can't say that. I don't know. You don't know. I mean, the, the body size doesn't mean your trachea is wide. Okay, so we don't know what your tracheal size is. Okay, so we don't know everybody's tracheal size. So there's no set amount of air. But we do know that the pressure must be between 20 and 25 millimeters of mercury or 24 and 30 centimeters of water. Are we clear? Any question? Now, can the tracheal diameter change from day to day? Yes, because the presence of this airway, will it cause inflammation? Yes, because do you have, are you used to having a plastic airway stuck in your, no. So the presence of this thing will cause some local inflammation. So the, the tracheal diameter size will change as the inflammation sets in. So when that happens, then we have to either deflate the cuff or, or, or pu pu push some more. Okay? If the trachea dilates, let's say after one week or more, then we will have to maybe change the, the tracheal uh, the, the and the trachea tube, okay? We'll, we'll put in a bigger size, all right? Yes. Oh, yeah, this is uh, an intubation for fear. I was thinking about like tracheotomy. Uh, we'll get to that later. I also we'll have to check for the size though, to check if oh, we did inflammation like weekly. Yeah, because we, it doesn't really change day to day, okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. So we've inflated the cuff, but we don't know the position yet, okay? Now, the remember when we were suctioning? How far did you insert the cuff, I mean the suction catheter again, until so this time, until it came out of the rectum? No, until it was. Until, it until you met resistance. Yeah. What was that that we hit that, that caused the resistance? What did we hit? You say cyphoid process, that's the bone. This is the trachea. So so when you put it in the airway, what did you hit with the catheter that you met resistance? What did you exactly hit? Okay, so you hit the carina. Okay. All right. So what is the carina? That is the bifurcation where your left and right mainstem bronchi, who is this carina? I guess her name's Karina. Karina. Is Karina or Karina? It's not Karina. 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 Okay. So this is your Karina. All right. So that's the Karina right there. So when you inserted the catheter, you hit resistance. That's what you hit. Okay. All right. So the tube, in the same way, our endotracheal tube must be two centimeters above the carina. Why not on the carina? Okay, because the yeah, the, the it will injure the, the 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 tissue. So it must sit right here. If it's going too far. Where will it likely go if you shove it down too far? Will it will where will it likely go to the right main stem bronchus or to the left? Let's say I shoved it too far. Why the right? 
Look at the shape of the right side compared to the left. Which one has a sharper turn? The left, the left has a sharper turn. So will a straight plastic tube turn left? It will go straight. So therefore, since the right lung is straighter, it will end up here. All right? Are we understanding each other so far? Okay. So therefore, um, so it will take time, right? So let's say we just intubated Meijin. So the doctor gave her rocuronium. Let's say the respiratory therapist put in the laryngoscope and then inserted the uh the um endotracheal tube okay and then pulled out the the laryngoscope and then use a stethoscope okay to uh, to inflate and then measure the pressure okay so we're good now we don't know exactly where it is because we we put it in but we couldn't see the yeah right, where exactly it is so we can tell the only way we can tell is to Check for an x-ray. Now the x-ray will be there. So when you call RRT, x-ray will be at the bedside as well because they know mm -hmm. they're needed. Okay. So when they do that, can can Meijin wait until we confirm placement before we start giving her breaths? No. No, we have to give her breaths right now. So while giving her breaths, we can see whether both chests, both sides of the chest are going up and down, or it's only one. So if it's only the right side is, is inflating, the left is not, where is the tube? Right. Too far down the right stem, main stem bronchus. So therefore, the, the, the RT will deflate and then move the tube up a little bit and then inflate again and then continue inflating. Okay, and then now we have both chest rise. Okay, we're good, but we're not done yet. So we can't secure the tube yet. We can't tape it yet because we need the x-ray, right? So x-ray will confirm placement. Another way we can confirm placement is to check for the presence of CO2. Right here. So the position of the tube is checked in two ways. First and earliest is to check for the entitled CO2. Entitled CO2 is checked by using a capnometer. So it's just a small device you put at the tip of the tube. So we'll put the sensor here at the tip, tip of the ET tube, and then it will sense for the presence of CO2. How much CO2 is there? If it's 35 or higher, where is the tube? Thirty-five, is that normal or high? No. Or low? That's normal. So is it in the airway? 35 or higher okay so 35 or higher where is the tube on the right place it's in the lungs okay the the airway is in the trachea <clears throat> what if it's less than 35 it has to be in the esophagus all right <clears throat> okay now we cannot again tape it until we get x-ray because Yes, antidote CO2 tells us that, yes, it's in the trachea. However, we don't know where exactly in the trachea. So we need the x-ray report in order to confirm placement. So the x-ray, <clears throat> the radiologist will put it in the report once they locate the in the tracheal tube. So they will tell you, okay, it's sitting three centimeters above the carina. So what will we do? It's sitting three centimeters above the carina. So what do we do? Push it down one more centimeter. What if it's smack against the carina? Pull it back two centimeters. Are we clear? Okay, as simple as that. So now we have the airway in place. Now we can secure it. We secure it with what? Well, we have commercial tube holders. We no longer use tape because can these patients drool yeah. yeah, they'll drool. Okay, because you have, can they swallow? No, because you, you have an airway in the mouth. So therefore, they cannot swallow. They will drool. When they drool, what will happen to the tape that you, you use there? Okay, so it will loosen, now useless. So now we have to use a commercial tube holder. 
because this one uses Velcro. Just tell me that it turned off. Okay, so we have different sizes. <clears throat> so this is how they come. It's now Velcro strap because no matter how you wet the Velcro, it will stay, it will stay sticky. Okay. Yeah. If there's no adhesive being used, are we clear? All right. So that's how we secure the endotracheal tube. Any question up to this point? So can you picture the whole process? Okay. So another job we need to do is, since the patient is only breathing through the endotracheal tube, what is your duty to make sure this stays patent, that nothing is obstructing it? What do you need to do periodically? When you put a toothpick or a lollipop in your mouth, what happens? It, it stimulates secretions, yeah? So what will happen if you have a plastic airway in your throat? So what will happen to this, to the lumen of the tube? There will be mucus there, right? Okay, so what do we do? Now it's blocked by mucus. Okay, so we have to suction. So when do we suction again? Well, that's how often, yeah. But how do we know that the patient needs to be suctioned? You see or hear, you see or hear secretions. What else? What do you know? What type of alarm? High or low pressure? The high pressure alarm goes off. Uh, what else? What lung sounds will I hear? Awesome. Remember, crackles are in the lungs. This is not in the lung. This is in the trachea. So you will not hear. Will this suck secretions in the lung? No, this will suck secretions in the airway. Okay, bronchi. Very good. What else? Can we hear wheezing? Yes. Was there secretions there? It can block, partially block the airway, causing wheezing. What else? What happens to the oxygen saturation when air is not going in? Okay, decreases and the patient's respiratory rate will increase. Okay, or let's say the patient is restless. Okay, so that could be hypoxia. Okay, hypoxemia. So you suction also. All right, can you remember all those? Uh, well, hopefully you have to on the exam. That'll be a select all the applied question. <clears throat> Okay, so our job so far was initiating the intubation. Second was to verify placement. Then third, to maintain airway patency. Fourth, uh, we, we skipped through the fourth. Our job was to secure the airway, correct? Using a commercial tube holder. Um, and then uh, the fifth will be making sure that the patient ha has optimal therapy, meaning you're evaluating response to treatment. Are they getting, because why did we intubate Mei Jean in the first place? Was she meeting her oxygenation needs? No. So how, what is your goal there for? Why did we intubate and put her on a ventilator? Because, okay, so to maintain adequate oxygenation. Is she or is she not? getting adequate oxygenation. How do we know that? Blood pressure. Oxygen saturation, what else? Blood pressure. What was her problem? Okay, ABGs, okay? Because can she can she tell us that she's okay? No. No, she'll be sedated. Okay, she'll be unconscious, she's sedated. So she can't tell us anything. So what's the only way we can evaluate her response to, th to the therapy? Fabs and her... ABGs. Okay, so whenever let's say you suspect, oh, patient is 
restless. Okay, she doesn't usually um throw feces, but now she's 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 grabbing feces from her from her butt and then smearing it around her face. Good. So that's confusion. Yeah. Okay. So that could be poor oxygenation. I don't know what I said. I don't remember. All right. So our duties uh, include monitoring May gene for complications of this treatment. So we'll, we'll, we have a long list. We'll go to that in a table later. So mentioned here, oh, the um, <clears throat> when she is on a ventilator, finally, because how do we breathe? Our natural, naturally, our air goes through the nose, yeah? So what does the our nose and our nasopharynx do to the air before it enters the lung? Okay, it filters, warms, and humidifies the air, right? So it goes into the lungs already warm and moist, yeah? So therefore, can we do that with a ventilator? Yes. The ventilator can warm and humidify the air, okay? And as already mentioned, the patient will be with a endotracheal tube up to when again? To two weeks, okay? But your textbook says 14 to 21 days. Okay. Why are we talking about an NG tube here? <laughs> Okay, so the AT tube will be in up to 14 to 21 days. But I don't see, I've never worked for a facility wherein we kept it longer than two weeks. So two weeks is the um, common cutoff, and then we switch to a tracheostomy. So here are the disadvantages. So again, why we switch to a tracheostomy? It's uncomfortable. Okay, It's a hard plastic tube in your in your mouth. There's no coughing. How can you cough? There's a tube blocking your airway. Secretions will be thicker because the tube is bigger. You cannot eat because you cannot swallow. And it has a higher risk of aspiration. Anytime you suppress the coughing reflex, then you're higher risk for aspiration. Why? What's the purpose of a cough? our cough reflex, to clear the airway. You can't do that, then you're at high risk for um, aspiration. So here, let's say the patient has had this, May Jean has had it for 14 days now. So now she's a candidate for a tracheostomy. So a tracheotomy is a surgical incision we will make on the second and third cricoid process of or cricoid rings of her trachea. So they'll make a vertical incision there and then insert the tube. Okay, so let's summarize our airway management. So immediately after inflating the, the cuff and checking inflation pressure and then verifying placement. So check immediately for chest symmetry. Uh, of the uh, chest expansion. Okay, so as we're bagging the patient, the patient's not even on a vent yet. We're still manually bagging. So make sure the there's equal chest rise. You hear lung sounds in both sides of the chest. So we immediately check end tidal CO2 and the X-ray. We check cuff pressure every six to eight hours. Why again? What happens to the Okay, so there's two, yeah, there's two possible problems here. If the cuff is overinflated, what will happen? You inflated it too much. It's beyond 25 millimeters of mercury or above 30 centimeters of water pressure. Ischemia can result and can that lead to necrosis? What if the cuff is underinflated? Less than 20 millimeters of mercury, less than 30 uh, less than 24 centimeters of water. Yeah, there is positive pressure, but what will happen? You don't have a seal. 
So there will be leaking. Okay, so you'll have leaking. And once you have a leak, if you think about it, what else is the purpose of this cuff? What else is it also preventing besides an air leak? No, the for air embolism, when we say air embolism, that means it's in the blood. So this is the airway. We put air there. So what could happen if the cuff is not inflated enough? Remember, this patient can't swallow. So uh -oh. there will be aspiration. Okay. So what are the purposes of the cuff inflation? Preventing leaks and preventing aspiration. So when you, you don't aspirate, so therefore there will be no pneumonia. All right. Okay. What happens in your breath when you wake up in the morning? Is that the best time to kiss somebody? No. Why not? What happens to your breath? <laughs> okay. So, and you, your breath still smells like that, even if you brush two or three times a day. Imagine these patients. Can they brush their teeth? Can they get up and brush their teeth? So they depend on the mercy of the nurse whether or not their, their mouth is, is clean, all right? So therefore, imagine the amount of bacteria in these patient's secretions, all right? You have an idea? Mm -hmm. All right, so therefore, do we, is it good if they aspirate? Okay. Will they, is the question if they get pneumonia or they will, they will get they will pneumonia. pneumonia? Yes, that bacteria will cause pneumonia. So always check for aspiration. Actually, there's always that chance because did you check the cuff inflation pressure every minute? No. So there's always a chance that the patient aspirated. Okay, little bits at a time. So ensure humidity. When we say TPs, this is um, a literally a T. So this is your endotracheal tube, yeah? So when we attach the circuit tubing of the ventilator, it's shaped like a T. So the T is one will be going to the ventilator circuit. Okay, there will be two two circuit tubings going to the ventilator. The other is the the suction port. Okay, so the other you will have a suction catheter attached there with a sleeve covering it because we're doing inline suctioning now. Okay, so that's the T. So the T piece is uh, like an adapter, okay, which you attach to the end of the tube. One again goes to the two circuits going to the ventilator, and then the other is for the suctioning, okay. So when you're when you see T piece, that's just the adapter. Oxygen as prescribed. So oxygen saturate. I mean uh, FiO two. The concentration of the oxygen delivered by the vent can anywhere be. It starts at 21% and then it can go up to 100%. We try to keep it around 40, 50%. That, that way we don't cause oxygen toxicity. Okay, so we, we, we try to keep the oxygen uh, F concentration or FiO2 around that area, 40 to 50. So we secure the tube using what again? Velcro. Okay, Velcro trait. Um, to make sure, because can the can the endotracheal tube move in and out, possibly? It is not secure. Yes, it can move. So therefore, as soon as we confirm placement, I forgot to mention this earlier, there are numbers on the tube here. Uh, it's not listed here, but uh, let's see if the tracheostomy has it. Uh, no. So the endotracheal tube has lines on it. It has lines every few centimeters. So this is your marking. There are numbers there. So you mark what number, how many centimeters is the tube at, at the teeth. If the patient doesn't have any teeth, then it'll be the lips. Okay? But you document that in your flow sheet. Okay? So where is the marking as it exited the mouth? That way we know from day to day, from shift to shift, whether it moved. Are we clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know you said if it moves in or when you go, you just pull back and push in. You push it or you pull it in? Uh, you, told, you tell the doctor or the RT and then they'll help you. Okay. Because we need to main, make sure the tube is in the right place. 
Okay, if the patient does have some confusion and let's say you verified it's not hypoxia and the patient is let's say dreaming or whatsoever and they keep biting the tube, then um, activating your high pressure alarm constantly, then you put a bite block. Okay, it's just something we put in the mouth to keep them from, you know, you've seen a bite block, right? In the dentist, sometimes the dentist puts that on you. Okay, so we put a, a commercial bite block just so we, they don't keep um, eating that um, endotracheal tube. Uh, suction technique, We, if it's an, in, an intubated patient, then it's always in line. We don't do uh, open suctioning anymore. We do, of course, if it's the mouth, then it's, it's using a yanker, um, uh, a yanker stick. Okay, but the airway will have to be in line suctioning. We change that catheter once every twenty four hours. So we turn and reposition the patient every two hours, and we also do oral hygiene whenever necessary. If the patient, let's say, is peaceful, not really having so much secretions. We do oral hygiene every two hours. So when you're turning the patient, then you're also Goodbye. doing oral care every two hours. So that way you remember, okay? So you're you're doing the chorhexidine, chorhexidine rinse in the mouth. Because yeah. remember, can these patients close their mouth? No. So if your mouth is always open, what will happen to it? Yeah. Dry and stink, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Since the extubation is already here, so let's say the patient has been off sedation, so we've, we've, we've done the spontaneous breathing trials, we'll discuss that later, uh, and they passed, meaning you know they're ready to be extubated, so this is the procedure. Uh, remember, this is the position of the endotracheal tube, right? So the procedure for extubation is we're going to quickly deflate the cuff and then pull the tube. Now, keep in mind, can this patient clear the secretions that are already here? No. When we suction the patient, that means we're suctioning inside, yeah? We're suctioning inside the tube. We cannot suction this area here. So there are secretions there, correct? Okay. So that's why the procedure says here that when you extubate, <clears throat> Okay, we hyperventilate the patient. Now, there is a certain type of endotracheal tube that has a third lumen, meaning instead of the pilot balloon only, they have a third suction port. We call that tube a high-low evac tube. What does that thing do? So it has holes here. The third lumen allows you to suction this subglottal area. So this is the glottis. This is therefore the subglottal area. So a high-low evac tube allows you to transfer the suction um, port from here to now this area, okay? But we don't see that high-low evac tube in most facilities. I know my hospital doesn't use that. <clears throat> but anyway, even if you don't have it, it will still work. So explain the procedure, hyperventilate the patient, suction as much as possible, and then uh, have give more oxygen, and then <clears throat> have the patient inhale. So quickly deflate the pilot balloon, and then quickly pull the tube out, and then tell the patient to cough like crazy. They have to cough like crazy because why? The secretions are here, okay? So as soon as you, it's one swift motion, takes two seconds, okay, deflate, pull, cough, 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 oh, oh, oh. Okay. and then give the patient as much oxygen after, uh, a few minutes after the procedure. And then monitor because sometimes they have airway swelling. Let's say it was traumatic when you pull it out, for instance, you panic, for instance, you pull too far or too fast and you cause injury. Any question on those two? Very good children. All right. So we already talked about the tracheostomy. Uh, here are complications. Don't worry. The explanation will be later in the table. So these are 
early complications with having an artificial airway. So you've got tube dislodgement, meaning the tube came out or at least was misplaced. Accidental decannulation. How does this happen, especially with the tracheostomy? Patient moves. Of course the patient moves. No. This is a tracheostomy. Okay, it could be possible. Let's say your sedation uh, was not affected. The patient woke up. No, saw the tube. What is this? They pulled it. Yeah. Or let's say the patient was sedated. What did the nurse not do? Yeah. Okay, so remember when we change the tracheostomy ties, what do we do again? Put two ties on first before you take off the old ties. Okay, there could be bleeding. <clears throat> this is from trauma because of the presence of the airway. A pneumothorax, because we will explain this later. This is in relation to a uh, viral trauma. Because remember, we're giving the patient positive pressure ventilation now. So there will be some pressure trauma, which can bust a, a hole in your lung. Okay, it can it can rupture a portion of your lung and causing a pneumothorax. It could be air embolism, <clears throat> this time in the bloodstream. Aspiration, very common, or a subcutaneous emphysema. So this is the uh, presence of air in the subcutaneous tissue. It's generally harmless. And here are some long-term complications. So patients who are on a trach forever, and these are the problems. <clears throat> and there's, here's our... Summary for a patient who has an artificial airway and is on a mechanical ventilator. So similar as above, suction is needed, oscillate lungs. All right, so nothing special. <clears throat> so here's your best practice for suctioning which is reflected in your checklist, so I won't repeat this. Yes, okay, so page 559, right? Suctioning procedure. Since it's the same, off, I mean, uh, publishing company, so they, they have the same uh, procedure as from your Taylor's fundamental checklist, which is on Canvas. So here are a few indications. You hear the abnormal lung sounds, the wrong chi, the wheezing. Or whenever you see or hear secretions. Is this sterile? Is this procedure sterile? Yes. Okay. I will explain PEEP later uh, when we get to mechanical ventilators. <clears throat> okay, managing the cuff, what's the pressure again? Which you check every six to eight hours? Okay, 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury or 24 to 30, 30 centimeters of water. How often do we check it? So any questions about the airway? Okay, let's proceed with the vent now <clears throat> after a short break. Come back at 12, 235.